What's up, everybody? This is Carrick from ACG, and this video is absolutely not sponsored by Slather. If you have a cut, bruise, burn, or questionably transmitted rash, try Slather. We can't guarantee that shit will work, but since its main ingredient is spackle, unlike your aunt who lives by questionable decisions, no one will be able to see it spread. Slather, when you're not sure if you're still contagious. Today, we are going to be taking a look at Supergiant Games' newest entry, Pyre, for the PS4 and PC. Now, imagine football, dodgeball, tag, and basically pagan rituals, and you sort of get this game. Pyre is out July 25th for the suggested retail price of $19.99. As always, if you like the video, eh, maybe subscribe. So here's my review for Pyre. Blood of your bowl, the only game where leaping into a fire is a good thing, and what would happen if the entire sporting league was run by Jafar from the Aladdin cartoon? Graphics are up first. So, you know, I actually remember seeing that old Wizards cartoon from like the 1980s and thinking, this is probably the creepiest cool thing that I've ever seen. But after a couple hours of exploring the Titan bone encrusted dancing desert flower warped locations of Pyre, I can say with certainty, for me, that's probably been pretty much trumped. And to me, it's the game's use of intelligent color work, and that's just one part. But each region not only has its own overarching color scheme and design, but the locations within them fade from massive treed forests to bubbling marshes filled with questionable liquids. But it's the subtle use of travel across that palette that has actually floored me here. Now, those who think it looks a bit like Banner Saga in some of his presentation would be absolutely correct, but to me it surpasses even that title, which, while delightful to look at, can have you run in suicide wind sprints between desolation and dreariness. While Pyre, even if you're investigating the depths of some endless sea with your strange sea snake Sir Gawain-like counterpart, just looks fantastic. And when the wagon rolls, boats, or flies across the game world, there's a subtlety to the animation that is really stupendous. And it's in the little things as well, like the hilariously overwrought leaps you can do, or the fruitless flying animations of a teammate whose body is at least two older Elvis Presleys over the weight limit for his hummingbird-like wings. Also, I have to say, technically, it runs really well. Showing in on the PS4 at 1080p, 60fps, and the PS4 Pro at 4K native and 60fps, and of course, on the PC with pretty much whatever FPS and whatever P you want if you have the money to throw at it. Pyre uses pretty much everything to its advantage, from the still pictures of characters discussing bad days on the playing field to the head-down, fuck-anything-on-the-screen, tear-ass move that your no-armed worm knight can perform. The level of attention and detail here, and honestly, some places, is a little bit off the charts. But that doesn't mean, unfortunately, that everything is perfect, because it's sadly not. There are a couple slightly odd design decisions. The game can be regrettably too busy, and when you mix six characters in a thousand hued color schemes, tearing full bore around an icy playing field, after something that looks like pretty much a magic eight ball and a disco ball had a one night stand, it can sometimes be very hard to see exactly what's going on with your characters. It's not impossible, but at times, I did find myself just sort of shrugging as a character got kicked off the playing field because, frankly, I couldn't even tell where they were. It's rare, but for some, it might be noticeable. Also, the static or mostly static character slides when discussing the story's elements in the game are surprisingly still and muted compared to pretty much everything else in the title. And to be honest, I expected rest animations or some kind of talking animations, but who knows, they might have tried and maybe it just didn't look good overall. I'd say this, Pyre is fantastic and its twisted sensibilities and warped look might sort of remind you of the time you made eye contact with that person on the street corner wearing a sign that says, I collect feet. The fact is, I doubt most of us will be able to look away. Sound. Music and voice. Sir Gilman. Very well. Manly and his offspring hold no small degree of influence within the Commonwealth, reader. There are many who would welcome his return. And of course, when it comes to audio categories, sound is up first. Now, this is good with a nice solid accompaniment of process sounds for audio separation that can be really helpful when your mass demons going head to head with the enemy's sentient Doberman human crossbreed at full speed. And sometimes sound is pretty much all you have that alerts you to what's going on. And really, even the traveling sequences are replete with all manner of environmental sounds like the waft of air under wing or the creak of an old wagon as it leaps across a chasm. Really good sound. Music. So I've been thinking about this. I find it hard to remember a more eclectic soundtrack from ambient synth, dire warnings of bad times coming all the way to vocal tracks that honestly, no hyperbole here, reminded me forcibly of that magnificent time in Red Dead Redemption when John Marston's writing into the end of all things. 
it takes a really deft hand to say, hey, look, we're going to mix a horn, tambourine, two mouth harps, and the world's most depressed piano. And somehow you come out with some unique tracks that speak not only of the locations themselves, but sometimes of the current state of the game. Really good music. Voice. So this one's all over the place, and it's sort of split into three parts. First, you have the first sentence kind of delivery we've seen in some games, where an entire first sentence is given, this time in an alien language, and then it switches to text from that point on. Now, those are filled with a heavy amount of modulation and adjustment to really settle in the fact that a demon woman with darkness as horns from legend will sound different than a puberty-ridden young man. Then you have the oohs and ahs that sometimes crop up with little audio reminders that a particular character was talking, despite the fact that you know that they're there already. Those moments seem a bit short-changed, especially when you compare them to the other parts where they at least have a full sentence announcing the beginning of that discussion. Then you have the announcer, or the main narrator. Imagine one-half football announcer, one-half leader of the Empire in Star Wars, and you sort of understand who this is. A snively, somewhat evil, almost drawn-out character who enunciates even his wishes of luck like he's vocally flipping your team off the entire time. Excellent vocals there from start to finish. I liked a lot of the areas of voice in this game, but there were a couple odd choices gameplay, and of course, a bit about the story. So Pyre really jumps into it. It tells the story of you, the reader, a person kicked out of the coveted commonwealth for the possible crime of literacy, because as we all know, knowledge isn't contained in books, it's contained in YouTube videos like this one. Now, all joking aside, you're kicked out and basically sent to the wasteland location, and you're quickly rescued by a team of men and women who find out that the key to possible redemption and possible return to the commonwealth is to play an ancient sporting event. Now, quickly, you begin traveling the world, meet and greeting and beating a series of unique characters that inhabit this world with you. Now, I do have to just say this. In many ways, Pyre, I feel, outdoes the Blood Bowl series by punching it right in its weakest soft points, and that's namely playability and true RPG facets, which Pyre has. Now, the RPG bits come in the form of four basic attributes that all impact the game itself, and less so the interactions outside the game. Things like doing more damage to the enemy's goal when you hit it or returning from the sidelines quicker if you're banned to your speed on the game board and otherwise. Now, with all of these attributes raising via various means like you mentoring the player, their time spent in game and their performance, as well as talismans you can find or buy around the game world, it really feeds into the cyclic nature of discovery that Pyre does so well, but I'll get to that in a second. Now, when it comes to the playability aspect of this title, it's pretty simple at first. Three of your players against three of the enemies, and your goal is to either throw the game's version of a football into the enemy's fire or leap into it yourself. Think soccer, but just saying fuck it and grabbing the ball and plowing through everyone on your way with reckless abandon. Also, each character can only move when they basically have the ball, so it becomes a game of hot potato football Burning Man concert in seconds, with some games' fields having their own environmental hazards as well, like tangling vines, icy water flows, and more. And when not moving, the player's auras wrap around them as a circle on the ground, and if an enemy has the ball, that means they have no aura, and they hit your character, boom, they're banished, and the ball flies into the air. It's really interesting and layered stuff, and shows that simplicity combined with options can actually do wonders for gameplay. For example, as characters level up, they get skills, and while there are very few and far in between when it comes down to the total number, there's basically less than 10 per character, the abilities can be game-changing and really change the strategy of the entire team itself. For example, the ability of your four-legged best friend at the start of the game and his ability to jump and then jump again, and then if you buy another skill, basically jump again all in the air like a flea-bitten version of Mario, that means he can skip the auras of the enemies and sometimes leap right over them into the pyre. Now that means if you can play defensively, moving two of your players to the bottom of the screen, let's say, and then taking your third higher, it means that not only will they have their auras, but if they're near each other on the bottom, then their auras grow and sort of combine together, which makes it harder for the enemy team to get a ball carrier past them without tossing the ball with questionable results or using the various skills I spoke about a second ago that might have the ability to fly or leap over it. And with each location you find, each choice you make in the game and learn a bit more about the game world as you travel from battle to battle, the more everything sort of clicks. And that's when the game, at least to me, opened up like a beautiful, creepy, sinister ass flower. You travel, talk, interact, then battle. And just when you think the game might be over, oh no, it completely surprises you by basically saying, oh yeah, we forgot to tell you that this was just the starting moments of the game. And it's that deft handling of story with the gameplay that really keeps it going. Superb handling of additional content. That is, until you notice a few startling omissions here and there. First, the game has no multiplayer mode that is online. It's local only, and I have to say, even though I am a fan of Blood Bowl, the idea of playing this online with friends is shockingly high in my mind, and the fact that I can't really bothers me. Also, there is no lost state. Now, before people start rolling their eyes, I can say this. Very few times in games does losing and not having to restart work out as anything other than a failure. 
Here, though, without giving away anything, I can say that the devs found a brilliant way to adjust it so that gameplay style and that cyclic rate of going back, losing and winning and how it all works together absolutely plays to the plot of the title. The first time you lose or the second or the third or the 43rd, depending on where and when you do it, can be incredibly interesting to see how the game is going to play out from that moment on. And to me, at least, that's really where some of this role playing came to show its strengths. Now, as you guys know, I test the difficulty on all games from those who like their bulls bloody to those who know that speed beats out a huge aura any day of the week. And here it's working pretty perfectly with normal being a nice solid difficulty for many, especially as the game doles out some various curb stomps in the later sections to the harder difficulty, which adds the requirement of forethought and strategy and really puts that front and center. Very well done. As a whole, the game is more than 12 hours long and I have over 20 simply due to how the game's main game plays out and the versus mode itself. There's a lot of content here. Fun factor. This is hilariously fun. It's warped and twisted fun to be sure. And when traipsing around the almost confusing twists and turns of a celestial realm, it can feel a bit like you're living vicariously through that one friend you have who doesn't think they have a problem with pot, but fills up an entire black garbage bag with it and then lights one in like a fucking hot air balloon. Because it gets warped, but in the most magnificent ways possible. And it's the visuals matched with what I think is excellent gameplay that really sets a tone for me. And while I would have loved online, and I would have loved maybe some more NPCs to flesh out the later game locations and matches, the fact is, there's a reason for everything in Pyre. And I think that for very few games, you can say that. So as you guys know, I rate games on a buy, wait for sale, rent, or never touch it again rating scale. Yeah, without a shadow of a doubt, this is a buy. Listen, guys, it's a sort of a sports football game mixed with a fantasy flair. There are no swords or no weapons, and I get that, and some people may not like it. But the world itself and the way in which you interact it and that feeling of travel as you move forward and the feeling really of community when you switch, add, and remove teammates is something that I feel many games like Blood Bowl have tried to do and missed glaringly compared to this. So anyway, that's it for me. I hope you guys liked the video. If you did, give it a thumbs up. If you didn't, give it a thumbs down. Remember, please check out the Amazon affiliate links or Patreon or Twitter. That is absolutely how you can help me continue to give you guys reviews that aren't two minutes long or filled with sponsored bullcrap. Peace out and enjoy the rest of your week.